Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? I'm doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. Well, I'm really confused because I've had power for days. Oh, yeah. All right. You were expecting the grid to go down. And that's what I was told. <laughs> oh, yeah. You got to watch your sources, man. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, have there been... I haven't seen that there have been big protests and so forth. I haven't seen anything. Although, I will tell you, I haven't watched a lot of news since the night of the election. Yeah. Because I've just been busy, like I say. I did, but... I watched coverage till like almost three in the morning that night. So like I've, I'm aware of what's been going on, but not like directly since. I haven't even watched Kamala's concession speech. I haven't watched either of the speeches. So I watched um, Trump's live at mm-hmm. like two in the morning. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and it was good. I mean, it wasn't anything. Um, it, it was funny. Um, he did talk about RFK some. Which which I thought was entertaining because he was like, oh yeah, we we've got we've got RFK. He's going um, he's going fix our health care and, and and blah 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 blah. But stay away from that oil. He's like, I don't want Bobby near that oil. <laughs> he was like, we're still gonna drill. Like he's great on what he's great on, but but stay away from the oil. I'll handle the oil. Yeah, well that um, that's why he's going to be a dictator, right? Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Wasn't that the context of the you know I'm gonna. A dictator, dictator on day one. day one was about drilling. It may have been. I don't even remember now. I thought it was. It might not be. I I may have. I you may know, be, you're right. It may have long. been about the oil. I don't remember now mm. um, about getting the oil going. But I just got a kick out of it. The way he yeah. was like, yeah, you know, I really like you on this one thing. But this other thing, just keep that to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> was basically the theme of it. Um, I, for those of you that are have... Just don't keep track of anything at all except through this podcast. Or if you're listening to this years from now, um, this is the uh, two days after the re-election of Donald Trump in 2024. Yeah. Just for posterity, throw that <laughs> so, yeah, throw that yeah. in there. So a little the, context. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, and it's all Elon's fault, I hear. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, heard that too. Because um, he is a, according to Jen Psaki, a um, disinformation propagandist. Oh yeah, <laughs> which I, I had to think about that <laughs> yeah, particular had to kind of do phrase, <laughs> yeah. uh, a little bit. But had to really break that one. Down I mean, I know word by word. I know what she's going for, but yeah, I don't. I don't know that it makes sense exactly like she means it. Yeah. Um. Uh, but yeah, it's it's all Twitter's fault again, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um. Or wait, was it Twitter's fault in 2016, or was it just Facebook? No, it was Twitter. Okay. I mean, I mean, Trump, Trump rode to the White House through a Twitter account. Yeah, like I mean, he completely bypassed the mainstream media and then used his Twitter to control the mainstream media all the way through 2016. I mean, mm-hmm. he just steamrolled them. Yeah, um, and nobody had ever done anything like that. That was a really like at the time it was a really big deal. Well, that's that's about his account and the things that he's tweeting, though, right? Yeah, yeah, that's um, what I'm getting at. But he, it, but 2016 the was problem really in 2024. Apparently, is that um, is that uh, Elon Musk allows all the misinformation and disinformation and malinformation out there, and it's because of all the misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation that Trump got elected again. Yeah, is that that the storyline? It's a lot of it. I mean, yeah. okay. We want to talk about that. There's, I mean, I think that there are definitely lessons to be learned here. Yeah. Yeah. And apparently, though, the the lessons learned are um, that uh, there are a whole lot more Nazis and racists and misogynists out there than we could ever have imagined. Yeah, right. that that's the lesson that it seems the left has yeah. learned and, so far. Well, and they're of all ethnicities, and all, the, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, especially Hispanic men, even though they didn't even vote fifty percent for Trump. Yeah, but and and black men, even though they also didn't vote fifty percent for Trump. Yeah, um, but their percentages were higher than they were in twenty twenty, and so therefore yeah. now all of them are racist and misogynist as well. <laughs> they're racist against their self. <laughs> yeah, well, or against each other or something. 
something like I don't yeah know. i mean i guess the uh the blacks don't like indians and the hispanics don't like blacks and so <laughs> therefore kamala ticked all those boxes and yeah. and of course they're all misogynist and they wouldn't want a woman running i mean <laughs> right. I, I do think i can't remember the girl's name um i thought of her as like a a film commentator or something though but i um i saw a clip and i i guess a I can't really say it on the podcast, which is a shame, but she's maybe I bleep this. Uh, let's see. What, what's the time? I, I don't know. I got to figure out how to do it. Cause we're still trying to remain family friendly. And this is one of those serious no, no words these days, but yeah. um, must be my favorite word. Might be. <laughs> it would be weird if this was your favorite word actually, uh. but she said uh, something like um, if you're a man and you vote for a woman for president, then you're a faggot. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's not my favorite word. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, oh, my God, it cracked me up. I mean, it, it's ridiculous, but it's yeah. also hilarious. <laughs> right. Um, and so maybe there was, maybe that got out to people. Uh, maybe. It's, but, yeah. Well, I, I mean, there are, there are lessons to be learned from this on the left. Um, I... I'm amazed. Well, first off, it became clear that I'm not my opponent was is not enough. Yeah, which is almost all she had. Yeah, I mean, like she had a little more than that, but not a lot. Like that was one of the big pitches. <laughs> yeah, but there's I, I don't know. There's uh, some irony in some of this stuff too because the um, the tagline now is that the war on women has begun. Yeah. Oh, I keep the war on women. It's the war on women. Now I keep you know. Post about blah blah blah. War on women. Yeah. And it, it's. I find it really strange that the left keeps claiming that um, the right wants a war on women and the left cares about women when the left can't define what a woman is um, <laughs> right. and has been so intent on trying not to offend a tiny percentage, less than 1% of the population that they've managed to alienate half of the population by trying to protect trans women over women, actual women, women, biological women. Absolutely. And so I'm not surprised that this kind of blew up at them. Um, But it was still, you know, still a majority of women voted for the left. Yeah. Um, but not a big one. Yeah. Like I mean, it was only a few points, six points or something like that. Yeah. Um, you would also think that like, maybe they would realize that if you, that they, since they abandoned the working class for the elite, the elites, yeah. the intellectual class and the media class and the government class and the, you know, people on the dole essentially but at the high level yeah um they're not so concerned about people that are that are collecting um food stamps they're a lot more concerned about um the people that are collecting big government contracts and uh you know getting paid at universities and so on yeah um that the uh that maybe you'd lose the working class yeah. Which, I mean, I think it made it really clear when you start looking at the numbers here that that the difference was the working class. Yeah. The working class and a huge majority voted for Trump over, yeah. over Harris. And there is, I think that they have been surprised to learn that there's a lot more people <laughs> in the working, in the working class. class than any other class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Um, I mean, I think you kind of nailed it, though, with the just with who they're who they they were trying to build a coalition around mm-hmm. and i mean it really was like the trump ra- trump ran on like common sense like mm-hmm. like you know we're going to and he he mentioned it all the time like we're going to bring common sense back to washington and the the harris campaign is like oh no we're throwing common sense out the window <laughs> like i mean it just it it kind of boggles my mind that they would think that they could win a campaign that way um what you looking at I'm looking at my notes. Yeah, uh, um, uh, yeah. I just I don't know. It's it's crazy that that and and it was really stark during the conventions. Like mm-hmm. I remember watching the um, RNC and just thinking, like I mean, that's all they talked about was like common sense stuff, you know. I mean, and some of it was kind of like 
like nonsense stuff. Oh yeah, we're we're not going to have women or um, men playing in women's sports. Like that yeah. came up a lot at the RNC, and it's one of those things. Well, and the media is saying, what a stupid thing to talk about. Yeah, and the but the <laughs> normal people are sitting here looking like, yeah, we shouldn't have to talk about this. This right. should just like this shouldn't even like be a thing that we're having to discuss. And the fact yeah. that we're having to, to discuss it is a problem. Yeah, we're not going to have men in women's locker rooms. Yeah, in yeah. high school. In high school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. And like, it's just so. And it, and it probably is an issue that's been overblown in terms of like how frequent that kind of problem I'm, arises. I'm but, sure it is. But the fact that it arises at all and the fact that uh-huh. it's a big part of the conversation is a problem in and of itself. Right. So, and, and to think that, that being on the wrong, the other side of that would be a winner just blows my mind. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I saw, uh, a recap that said that non-college graduate women voted 63 to 25 in Trump's favor, really? almost two to one or wow. better than two to one. No, it had to have been 63 to 35. <laughs> and I read that down wrong. Had to have been 35, right? Oh, yeah. That doesn't make sense. Oh. I mean, I don't know, unless there's like a percentage that are uncommitted. Well, I mean, there's going to be a couple of percent, but not 12%. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and this is, uh, this is uh, exit polling. Oh, Okay. Gotcha. So, yeah, I did um, not get a chance to really sit down and go through the exit polling as much as I would have liked to have. Yeah. I remember when I saw it at the time thinking, wow, it was almost two to one. So it had to have been 63-35, not 63-25. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it, I mean, I think that the the lesson that the Democrats took from that is that they need to send more women to college, not that <laughs> yeah. maybe they should be talking to those right. people instead. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, and, and Trump really, I felt, went out of his way to make a message for everybody. Um, it certainly made a message for people that are struggling. Yeah. And and there's a lot more of them than there should be. Yeah. And so by saying, you know, I'm not going to let uh, illegal immigrants come in and compete for you and undercut your job, um, and I'm going to, uh, you know, bring inflation down and, you know, get control of prices by managing our money better and so forth. I mean, it's probably BS. I mean, like he, yeah. he's, but he's a sounds... big part of the problem. Like he started this, but, yeah. um, and he's going to impose tariff tariffs, which aren't going to exactly fix that. No, no. Um, <laughs> but it, on, but at the, the same message time is strong. Like if you're going to, he got to make up some money somehow, honestly, like if the government's going to spend, like it's going to spend now, I'd love to see, him actually get in there and start cutting programs. Yeah. I mean, that's like I say, let me just say this just kind of off the bat for everybody. Um, I am optimistic about this next Trump term, but I am not like all in that. This is just going to be the most amazing thing. Like, I I think that we're going to see a lot of what we saw in the, his first term where it's just not, you know, he lets you down a lot. Yeah. But the prospects are pretty good. And the deal with having Elon come in and start trying to, like, really slash some government. Yeah. And he's talking about Elon's, like, already invited Ron Paul to come, like, be, put, have some input on that. Mm-hmm. Like, that's promising stuff. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I'd like to see if, if they can actually pull it off. Now, he shouldn't have, actually, any trouble cutting executive agencies, yeah. which is most of them. Yeah. Um, exactly. So, you know, we'll see if they actually do, but then what you'll end up having is the bureaucrats then get in his ear and, and talk about how important they are for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, whatever they've been telling people for the last 50 the, years the, that the, keeps them funded. Well, one, a big part of that though, is the gonna run, gotta win another election. And that's mm-hmm. something that Trump is not going to be concerned about with this. Um, and that's actually a good thing. Um, that he's he's actually going to be he's not going to be listening to those bureaucrats telling well you know if you do this it's going to cost you here or you do this it's going to cost you votes there mm-hmm. like that's not going to be in the in the conversation anymore yeah um, and that that should help to mm-hmm. make to to for him I mean I'm not I hope like, so once again, I I go into this very optimistic mm-hmm. but. I know there are people listening. It's like, yeah, there's no way that's not going to happen. And th- yeah. those people may very well be right. I'm just saying, I, I always like to go into a new president optimistic. I yeah. mean, I did it with Biden. I did it with Obama. Like I, I did it with Trump 
first term. Like I like to, I like to have that optimism. Like, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm more of a skeptic. I am marginally optimistic. Marginally, hey, uh, I, and I know, I know the temper of my expectations, but I do mm-hmm. like to. I mean, it's an exciting time with the new president, and I like to go in yeah. optimistic and and hope that they follow through on at least some of the good things that they mm-hmm. promised. Well, the, I mean, there's certainly something to be said for that. If he puts a real libertarian or libertarians yeah in legitimately influential positions yeah. um i'd feel like that was worth it uh if he so do you frees have, ross ulbricht so that's to me that's the big one i, I mean honestly and i do think he's going to do it because yeah. he's ta- he he talked about it at the convention and announced it mm-hmm. but he has talked about it multiple times in fact it was a couple of weeks ago but he put a post up about it on his truth social yeah I, I think well, that that's it was one. A, it was a day one promise, so we'll know really quickly. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. It's time to start circling the wagons if it don't happen. Yeah. So, um, we'll I'll be excited to see that. I think that's mm-hmm. a big one. Um, um, if he actually cuts programs, uh, if if we actually have a president that goes in there and makes government smaller instead of larger, that's yeah. a huge win. Like yeah. I, that. When's the last time that may have never happened before? No, I know I mean, it happened before. I think I like John say, Taylor was one of these people that like cut everything <laughs> and so forth. But yeah. it's been a long time. Yeah. Um, long, long time. And I know some there's some people out there that are like, oh, well, what about Reagan? Reagan did not make government smaller. <laughs> yeah. I was fixing to say like Ron Paul, like I'm I'm kind of taking this all from um what I've heard, but my understanding is like Ron Paul was a big supporter of Reagan for his first term. Mm-hmm. And then abandoned ship after he announced his first budget. Yeah. <laughs> like that was, that was the story. In fact, I think I heard Rand Paul tell that story, like in a speech somewhere sometime mm-hmm. where he was talking about his dad and was like, yeah, it took the first budget for my dad to like walk away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, Oh, I thought he was going to yeah, be good. Oh, yeah, well. but this, this wasn't what we ran on. <laughs> um, and there's plenty wrong with Trump and I'm oh, yeah. like, I'm concerned about what happens in the middle East. I'm concerned with, uh, our relationship with China. Yep. Um, on the plus side, I'm less concerned about our relationship with Russia. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because he's Putin's puppet. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's and, why. Right? <laughs> I mean, but he's it, just going to let Putin take over all of Europe now. Yeah. This, this has been my biggest complaint about the existing um, regime in Washington, D.C., is I think that it has been a huge dereliction in duty for the Biden administration and Anthony Blinken specifically to not be talking yeah. to Russia, to yeah. not have spoken with Russia essentially yeah. in two and a half years. Um, this is, I, I don't, I'm not worried about that being the case with Trump. Yeah. Now, Trump thinks he's just going to go in there and solve it, but this is, because of the Biden administration and Anthony Blinken specifically, um, this has progressed to a point where there's not going to be an easy answer. Yeah. Um, there are, there are things that Putin at this point has said, this is required just to keep talking. Like yeah. this is, this is our starting point. No. Um, where uh, Trump has said, yeah, that's not going to happen. So th- I, I don't think it's, that he's just going to go gonna in and solve tough. the problem. Yeah. That said, I think he wants to, and I think yeah. that he'll talk, and that's a huge improvement. Well, and the truth <laughs> is, is Putin's as much as Putin has the upper hand here now. Mm-hmm. He does. He wants this war over too. Oh yeah. So I mean, yeah. I, I just because he's got a high bar as far as Putin does right now, mm-hmm. he'll move that as as negotiations. Start. I don't thought it was going to be a take two there, but okay. <laughs> so I think where the power failed. Yeah. Because the grid went down. <laughs> um, our our personal grid. <laughs> our, yeah. Um, is uh, talking about the negotiations that Trump's going to face with Vladimir Putin. Um, and I, I don't know how to pick up from where we were. Cause that was several minutes ago <laughs> that we were talking about it. But the, um, at this point, Putin has, has said that like those four regions, it, we're not negotiating over them anymore. Like they're part of Russia now. Yeah. They voted to become part of Russia. They are 
militarily occupied primarily by Russia. So they're politically and militarily Russian now. Um, it Their populations are hugely Russian ethnic and Russian speaking. Those were oppressed people in Ukraine. It would only be worse at the settlement of this war if they go back to Ukraine. Yeah. Um, I mean, they were oppressed. They were oppressed groups and Russian ethnic people were an oppressed group in Ukraine before this war began. And it can only get worse from here. No. I mean, I don't think that they're going to feel better about their (laughs) Russian population after this war. Yeah. Um, Of course, the biggest mistake is not permitting or I say not permitting. I guess he could have made his own choice no matter what. But Zelensky, uh, I think the biggest mistake was encouraging him to maintain the war and to leave the negotiations that they had just a couple months into the war where they could have settled for letting um, the Donbass territories, Donetsk and Luhansk, become independent states and promise not to join NATO and so yeah. forth. Like that, that could have been, that could have been the end of it there. <laughs> now you've lost Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia and Kharkov and Crimea of course was never gonna <laughs> be a part of Ukraine again. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know about the NATO thing. Of course I think NATO's, useless and should have been abolished long ago anyway Trump's at the fall of the Soviet it. Union. Only uh, passingly. No, he hasn't really talked so much about... he's He hasn't really talked about getting rid of NATO. He's talked about making sure that everybody pays their share. Yeah, I mean, he's... Well, and that's definitely not the same thing. I mean, he's yeah. threatened to leave NATO if everybody doesn't start paying their share. But yeah. that's not... He's not talking about getting rid of NATO. Yeah. Um... But his, if he thinks he's just going to step in there and negotiate a settlement, uh, he there's no way that Trump will agree to a settlement that doesn't look like a win for him. Oh, absolutely. He's not capable of that. <laughs> and I don't think that there's a settlement that Putin will accept at this point that Trump could call a win. Yeah. Well, like I say. In good time, I think that I think that it can be done, but mm-hmm. it's going to be. But like I say, there's going to have to be concessions on both sides. And while while Putin is operating for, with an upper hand, it's not that much of an upper hand. It's enough. Yeah. I mean, I, I to me, I don't see that this is settled without a Russian win. Yeah. It's either a Russian win or everyone loses, and yeah. I'd rather have the Russian win yeah. than everyone losing. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, I just don't see how you, I I don't see how you get around that. But what that means is that Trump would have to accept a settlement where the West loses. Yeah. Well, he just blames it on Biden. Well, that's true. I mean, he could get away with that. He could have done that, of course, in his first term with the wars, though, too, and he didn't. Yeah. I mean, he could have he could have drawn us out of Iraq and Syria and everywhere else right from the beginning, Afghanistan, right yeah. from the beginning of his term, and said, "Hey, look." That's their wars. That's yeah. Bush's war and Obama's war. Yeah. Like, I'm <laughs> I'm playing no part in this. Yeah. Um. But at least I'm encouraged that I think that he actually wants it to end. Yeah. And and he even talks about the Middle East in the same way that like you just want the want the death to stop. Yeah. I'm less confident in what he the way he handles the issues in the Middle East though. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's definitely a, a true believer when it comes to Israel. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, like just give them whatever they want. Like I, yeah, be the biggest friend to them he can. So, um, I mean, of course, a lot of people were like, "This is the real problem with Trump is that he's going to go all in for Israel and Kamala wouldn't." I don't agree with that necessarily. Yeah. I don't think that there's a potential for him to be worse. Yeah, but. Like I said, he at least is making the claim that he just wants the the killing to stop. Yeah. And Kamala would have gone out there and and occasionally said bad things about Netanyahu or Israel's choices or whatever, but would have permitted no everything in the background. Yeah, no action. Um, and I don't 
I, I at least have some hope that Trump won't be like that. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll see. But he is also an Iran hawk, and they had no trouble convincing him that Iran wanted him dead. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. That that part scares me, but that's not likely to become um, a nuclear war. And yeah. Ukraine, it may only be a few percentage points chance that it becomes a nuclear war, but that's way more than I want. Anything over zero <laughs> is bad. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, but but Trump has his problems. Oh, I, like I'm, I'm worried about the Middle East. I'm worried about China. Yeah. 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 Um, and China for sure, because he's definitely a, a China hawk. Yeah. And, and that's where I feel like the, the deep state, if you want to call it that, like that's been the next war. Mm -hmm. Like that's, and the fact that you've got Trump in there just kind of adds to that likelihood that something can happen. Yeah. This is one of those places where, um, Trump's agenda and the permanent state's agenda kind of overlap. And that's yeah. frightening. Yeah, that's, that's bad. Um, but at the same time, because he's so concerned about China, that's part of the reason that I have hope for how he handles the Middle East. Yeah. Because I think Trump, at least like maybe intuitively, understands that if we're going to shift towards China, we can't get ourselves bogged down in another forever war in the Middle East. Yeah. Where supporting Israel would become that, especially if you open up a front with Iran and, oh, and yeah. everything. So... Um, I think that because he's so intent on being antagonistic towards China, he's going to try and extricate the U S from the middle East as much as possible. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. Neither of these are exactly wins by the way. No, no, <laughs> but it, it, you know, there are worse alternatives. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, yeah, I don't think that this is going to be, this is going to be the end of war, but one of the things that people, complimented him on in his first term was that he didn't start new wars. And that's something that he started saying too. Yeah. He's telling like, that too. Like, Oh, people like that. I didn't start any new wars. So <laughs> like, right. I'm just going to keep reminding them that I didn't start any new wars. And, and with him, I think that that means that he also wants to do that again. Yeah. Yeah. He, he would like to come out of his second term and have two terms of being able to say that I didn't get us involved anywhere else. Yeah, I'm the first president in however long that didn't start a new war. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that'd be a pretty cool thing for him to walk around and say the rest of his life. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> because, and you really kind of got to look at this It's Trump's, such a low bar. <laughs> well, it is. But you, you kind of got to look at Trump's second term in those frames. Like, mm -hmm. what is he going to walk around and say the next couple of decades or however long he lives after he le leaves office? Yeah. Like, and that's how he's going to run his term. Like, is based off, what can I brag about? What can I do now that I can brag about mm -hmm. the rest of my life? Yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and that's why I think that 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 thing about him starting new wars is such a good thing is because he's he's so braggadocious and yeah. um, he's so intent on people thinking well of him mm -hmm. um, that if he sees that as a pathway to people thinking well of him, he's going to try and achieve yeah. that again. Yeah, absolutely. I hope and make that part of his legacy. Yeah. So, and there's yeah. definitely worse things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, he, you know, he could have, he could have been listening to Bill Crystal and Dick Cheney and so forth and been told how great he was for starting six new wars. Yeah, exactly. And be trying to do that again. So I'm glad yeah. I went the other way, but, but that's the other thing. And that's part of the appeal, I think of Donald Trump is that he's not really so interested in what those people think of him. No, absolutely not. He He's actually seems to be at least more interested in what normal people think of him. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, he's not trying it, to impress the elites. He's trying to impress everybody it else. It is crazy that our system has broke down in such a way that that's an unusual thing from a politician. Yeah. To take, to actually care about what the people who voted them in think. Mm -hmm. Well, this is actually, I think the most um, exciting or, you know, optimistic aspect of Trump's reelection okay. is that, um, even though I don't think that he's, he's such an outsider as a lot of people do, people voted him into office because they think that he's not part of 
that elite group yeah. of people that are running the country. They see him as an outsider and somebody who's against the system, and that's why they voted for him. Yeah. And I think that is really encouraging. Yeah. About the like that makes me feel good about the electorate. Yeah, right. Um, that well, there are enough people out there that that see him as challenging the powers that be, and voted for him for that reason. That he gained office with with the entire. I don't know. Um, I don't want to say popular class, but influential class against him. Yeah. Well, and that's. Man, I tell you, I was going to be so bummed if he had lost. And, the, and because, of, because of this right here is yeah. that Kamala Harris packed up with Liz Cheney and just all the Warhawks and just like campaigned with them. Like yeah. didn't just take the Cheney endorsement, but like had Cheney on the campaign yeah. as a surrogate. And the fact that that they could be so brain dead to think that they could win a campaign that way just... I mean, and if they had, I just <laughs> well, imagine yeah. how bad, what what we would be sitting here thinking of this country right now if she had won with that campaign. Yeah, it would have been really depressing for a candidate to be able to win by, um, by touting an endorsement from the Cheneys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would it would really. I mean, it, it just yeah. I, that would have made that would have made me feel miserable. I. And just because of what it says about the the, the voters, country. yeah, yeah, yeah. that a, that a Cheney endorsement could help you, that you could write a Cheney endorsement to the White House at this point, yeah. would be the most horrifying thing I can imagine. Like yeah. all those people that are that are way on the far left that are completely melting down about Trump yeah. winning office. I wouldn't have been melting down about Kamala winning the presidency, yeah. but I might have been melting down that you could that you could ride a Cheney endorsement to the White House. Yeah. And now Cheney may be your next Secretary of State. Oh, you mean if Kamala had won? If Kamala had won, yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, she would have ended up in the administration. Kamala talked all the time about going to have a Republican in her administration. Mm -hmm. It was going to be Liz Cheney. Yeah. The that's... question would be where where was she going to put her? Mm -hmm. um, and where do you think she would want to go? Somewhere mm -hmm. where her dad can help her, advise her on what she needs to do. <laughs> Well, in the the Trump campaign was a very interesting coalition. It really was. Um, I mean, um, when you start looking at the at the people that he brought together, especially towards the end with Elon and stuff, like it's, I mean it it's it's a group of dissenters. Yeah. Well, it might have been a business move for Elon. You know, he's he's kind of made his career off of getting government money to yeah, do stuff. So. Exactly. There's there is that fact. <laughs> but um but Elon has Or maybe he was just trying to avoid those triangular work camps. No, <laughs> maybe. That could be it. Yeah. <laughs> um but Elon is um he has libertarian tendencies. If you follow his Twitter, like he posts stuff and it's like, man, like he does kind of get it. Like, yeah, I, I suppose. It's, it's I mean, flashy. I would have called him a leftist it's, eight or ten years ago. Yeah, well, I mean, he seemed like more one, more of one then. But mm -hmm. I think he's kind of woke up as the years have went by. Yeah. Or, or he's realized where the wave is at to ride. I well, mean, there's always too. that, too, mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about these type of people. I mean, maybe he's just hardcore free speech guy, and he always has been. I mean, it's been less than you could have hoped for, I suppose, with Twitter or X. Yeah, but uh, it's but, better than it was. But it's it's definitely better than it was, and it's something that he talks about. And it could just be that he was really a hardcore civil liberties person, and he was seeing how the left had pushed against civil liberties. Yeah. Except for abortion. Yeah. Right. Which is a, apparently the most important civil liberty. Not yeah. that you can talk out loud or publish wherever you want or yeah. anything. Or, or have or choice have, about what you put in your body. Yeah, or freedom of religion or any of those other things. But it's really important that you be able to kill your... Um, Unborn child. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, amazing. And but, and the truth is that like the, <laughs> that was part of the Kamala campaign's problem, too, is that they were almost wholly reliant on this one issue that was kind of a made-up issue anyway. Well... Because... Trump never said that he was going to entertain a uh, nationwide abortion ban. 
No. And in fact, he expressly, I, I'm pretty sure I remember him expressly saying that he wouldn't well, no, entertain he, a nationwide he, he abortion did ban. Expre- he, he, his position throughout the whole campaign, and he was very vocal about it, was let the states decide. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was that like over and over again when they, anytime they pressed him about it, like, well, what do you think of what this state did? What do you think of what that state did? He all, it was an easy retort for him. He was always like, well, that decision made, that state made its decision. Yeah. Like that's he was like let the states figure it out, mm-hmm. which is where I'm at too, coincidentally. But um, but that was that was his campaign um tacked on that. Yeah. So yeah, so they're they're trying to push Kamala into the White House on this issue that's essentially a made up issue. That's the only issue she had, and like, I think that they're um really uh off base about how important they think that is to a majority of women anyway, or how big a percentage of women that they think that that's a big issue too. Yeah. No, they're, they're, they're wrong about that. Well, but they're, what they're looking at is the, the midterms that mm-hmm. it was a big deal during those midterms. And then yeah. they gain some seats and some traction through that. Um, and that's, that's kind of what they're looking That's, that was their play. They were like, well, this is the one issue that we're winning on. So it's going to be the only issue we're going to talk about. Yeah. And, well, and they, um, and it's kind of part and parcel to the same thing, but they were really reliant on this project 2025 thing. Trump's project 2025. Yeah. Which it was never Trump's thing at all. That and Trump he, does nothing but walk away from yes, every time exactly. it comes up. Like, <laughs> I heard somebody, gosh, I wish I could remember who it was so that I could give them credit because I thought this was a funny line. Because they were like, they were joking about the, the Trump's Project 2025 thing. Mm-hmm. And, then, and they said, uh, I, I can tell you for sure that Trump had nothing to do with Project 2025 because that document is like 800 pages. And Trump has never read 800 pages of anything in his entire life. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And the other reason you can tell is because Trump's name's not in it anywhere. Yeah. All over it. You <laughs> yeah. Mean. Right. Like there's no way Trump had it. The top it. of every page. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that man knows how to promote and mm-hmm. self promote. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, that's the other part of this that I think is probably worth discussing is um, is to not underestimate like how dangerous it would have been for Kamala to have won the presidency, and yeah. not because of Kamala herself, but of the the ability for the powers that be to push a wildly unpopular. Yeah candidate when she was a presidential candidate when she got less than one percent and had to drop out before iowa right yes yes she Um, she got zero delegates and didn't get any of the primary votes and like was just a truly awful candidate and to have skipped the entire democratic process that exists such as it is within the democrat party yeah and get her on the ticket and if they had managed to succeed in pushing her into the White House, I think that that would have would have set an a precedent that that maybe this country would never have overcome in terms of um, small groups of people deciding who the next president was going to be. Yeah, and then having control over because she's not. Oh yeah, I mean they want her she's, because she's a puppet. Because she's a puppet, exactly. Yeah. Um, no, you're absolutely right. Like that's just, but. The the silver lining here that I think deserves a little talking about too is that the 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 Democrats will now be forced to reckon with this loss. Mm. And <laughs> well, well, they they don't have a choice. I mean, yeah, but they've already decided that the reason that they lost is because apparently half the country is racist well, or misogynist. Or just stupid. So that's what and stupid is what they're really sticking to. Yeah. It's because because that it was so much of the people without college degrees that voted for Trump and such yeah. a high percentage compared to voting for Kamala that it's obviously it's because people are too stupid in this country to make the right decision. Well, even if that even if everything you're saying is true, they're going to take away from that that they've got to learn how to talk to us stupid people. No, what they're going to take away <laughs> from that is how to limit the impact of stupid people on future elections. Well, which could, is why her winning like in this particular way could have been so bad. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. And that to, to your point, though, so that's what they're talking about in front of the cameras right now. Mm-hmm. But trust me, the movers and shakers in the Democratic Party know better than that. And I they, don't know. I think they get high off their own supply, man. I, yeah, but there, but there ain't no supply right now. <laughs> oh, sure there is. There's exactly that. Yeah. That, that we, um, the Washington Post didn't tell people who they're supposed to vote for because they abdicated their responsibility. And so all those stupid people out there voted for Trump instead of Kamala, who they obviously would have voted for if, if organizations like the Washington Post had just been brave and told them. Yeah. Well, and it, I mean, but this, this is a point that keeps coming up. And they, they're not saying it like, well, pe- people are stupid, but they're saying it in the sense that people were so easily misled by Elon Musk's misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. Yeah. And, you know, they're saying it in kind of a roundabout way, maybe because they think because the people are so stupid that they won't understand that they're being called stupid. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but this this does seem to be the takeaway. Well. We'll see. And what they're doing, of course, is they're actually alienating everybody even more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I, they're going to, they, the Democrats will have to do some soul searching here. Mm-hmm. Like they're in, and the hope is, at least my hope, is that at the, at the end of the day, we'll end up with a better Democratic Party. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's the hope. Like, because so something the Democrats absolutely did here with the deal with Liz Cheney is like they embraced war and and the neocons and th- i they're not going to make that mistake again i would think oh i mean we'll see i may be wrong about that that i may be wrong about but um we'll see i my prediction would be though that they're going to walk away from the neocons and not look back leaving them nowhere to go because yeah. the i mean who knows the republicans in 4 years may be different than they are now mm-hmm. i don't see that though um, leaving the neocons with nowhere to go. And that's going to be an interesting, because they're going to go somewhere. Um, it'll be interesting to see how all of that plays out. Well, I, okay, I'm definitely more glass half empty on this topic than okay. you. Um, I think both parties are going to be worse after this four years. Okay. Um, I think the the left is going to go, is they're going to sink deeper into the rad- radical progressive left Okay. Um, and be, become more insane about all these weird social issues. Well, uh, like the Trump's first term would bear you out on that because the, the left changed after four years of Trump mm-hmm. you and you're right about that. Like, yeah. I, I mean, like, so, I mean, that is a fair prediction yeah. that we will see a continuation of that. And I, I think that you're right in that the neocons will, will get pushed out of the left in that case Yeah, and they'll go back to the right. Yeah. And after Trump, who do you have? I don't know. I mean, do you I think mean, J.D. Vance, they're going to let J.D. Vance run for president in four years? I doubt it. I, I think yeah. that the neocons go back to the right and that you end up with a more staunchly, um, you know, conservative, like hardcore right wing party. Yeah. Uh, like the one that we had years and years that, ago. I'll, I'll give you that that is a, a very real possibility. You're going to end up with a Mike Pence type of I, presidential I candidate. Just, I don't picture it, though. Like, you may be right, because the neocons will have to go somewhere else. <laughs> um, I just don't see a Mike Pence or anybody like that making it through a presidential primary. Well, I'm not, I don't mean Mike Pence specifically. No, I know you don't, but but I'm just talking about a a neocon. I don't see a neocon. I don't think Mike Pence is a neocon. I think the neocons go back to the right, but I don't think Mike Pence is a neocon. What I mean is I, I, you know, some kind of stodgy old conservative, um, you know, Christian conservative guy that, uh, feels like they need to, um, impose their morality on the country and so on. Like that, that's the kind of person because, this outside the box, like, um, like outsider candidate. Yeah. I don't think they're going <laughs> to let that happen again if they possibly can. Yeah. I think that the, the core of the Republican party think that thinks that Trump has been an absolute dis- disaster. Oh yeah. No, there's no question about that. And the, they don't the want that kind of representation. 
will do anything they can to get Trump out and go back to 2008 and 2001. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Let's get another Bush. Yeah. No, they're, you're right. But the voters, I just don't think will allow for that. Well, um, no, I, I don't And I may know. be wrong about that. But, I mean, I see the future of the party in Vivek, in, um, in Vance. Like yeah, those, I think those they're going to f- have to find a new home. I don't think that there's enough of them, and I don't think they have enough support from the donor class yeah. to do it. And I don't think that they're. I, I don't think that they can create the kind of groundswell that Trump did. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's possible. Those are those are particularly Vivek. I think uh, Vivek is is sharp and he's well spoken. He's yeah, ju- he's, he can be charming. He can get people worked up. Yeah. Um, and I think but, that, but they I don't have the name. Uh, like the Trump name came into it with the name recognition. No, he did. Um, and you're right about that. I do think that there will be enough people that remember Vivek, though, from his last presidential run mm-hmm. and that and how closely aligned he was with Trump through his presidential run and that that may give him enough of that just street cred yeah. to, to well, pull he, that movement. He may get his best chance is to get a position where he's in the spotlight in the administration. Where he gets to talk a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, J.D. Vance won't have one. No, he won't. The vice yeah. president just doesn't. No, but he inherits all of the vice president. I don't know whatever the. I mean, vice presidents tend to make good um, presidential candidates. Like we just had one. Yeah, not, that was a, a horrible exception. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, they inherit that. Um, I don't know ground uh, the the movement. I guess I don't know yeah. what to call it, but yeah. Um, so mm, I don't know. know. It'll be interesting to see kind of where the where the movement goes from here. And to be truthful with you, all of that kind of hinges on the next four years not being an absolute shit show. Yeah. <laughs> and and they're gonna be. The yeah. question is how what kind of shit show are we gonna see? Mm. You know, because it's it's gonna be I mean, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean it's yeah. I don't know. It, it it's I'm Okay, one more quick topic then we go. Okay. Um I just find this interesting. All right. All right. So, uh on January 6th, yeah. They uh certify the election results, right? That's yeah. that's the date that that's the, the date that, they... that the Senate certifies the election results. Yeah. Right. Um, the person who oversees the certification of the election results in the Senate is the president of the Senate. Yeah. Which is the vice president. Yeah. So Kamala Harris will be overseeing the certification of the election results where she lost. Yeah. She's already said she'd do it. I mean, she said it before the election, like yeah. over and over again. Yeah, well. <laughs> I mean, we're going to see. Like, it, it should be interesting to see if she does it or not. Yeah. Um. We may be looking at January 6th, 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> With the left as the um, troublemakers yeah. this time, maybe. I don't yeah. know. Um, I just I just find it interesting that, that she's going to be in there overseeing the certification of the election results where she lost. Yeah, right. Um, one other thing real quick. Um, so who do you think that if Trump does put a libertarian in his cabinet, who do you <laughs> think it'll be? Oh, I have no idea. Really? Um, None. So it was mentioned at the watch party by somebody um, that Angela McArdle could be that. I don't and think. I think that's an interesting thought, though. Like, yeah. I don't know that that's going to be it, but it is widely known that she has Trump's ear. Like, like yeah. I mean, she's pretty, I mean, she's she's got, and she's done a lot as far as, like, everything with the campaign and stuff. She's been very involved. Well, she'd have to leave the party, the, the party chair. Yeah. To um, do that. But you couldn't argue that she's not a libertarian. No, <laughs> no, no, certainly not. <laughs> so, so she has that. I, I would like to say, and I, I don't know how everybody else feels about this. I don't even know how you feel about it, but I think it would be really neat if Trump picked Chase Oliver. <laughs> you can't say he's not a libertarian. He ran as, as the party's standard bearer in the yeah. last election. So you you take that out of the equation. Yeah, I and, voted for him. And you, like I say, play, like <laughs> in a, the end, a, I voted for him. Yeah, I um, mean, if I had been in a swing state, it might have been a little different. But yeah. I wasn't worried about whether this our electoral votes in Alabama were going to go to Trump or not. Yeah. Um, and all things considered, I was like, well, I mean, 
I, I don't, honestly, I don't know that I could have brought myself to vote for Trump anyway. I just have too many problems with him. Yeah. Um, and I hate that idea of like, well, I got to vote for this guy to prevent the other guy. That just, I don't well, like, I feel like I'm being blackmailed in that case. Yeah. Um, and I don't like that. And so in the end, I voted for Chase Oliver because, um, well, I mean, mostly because I had hoped that he would accumulate enough votes to maybe we don't have to fight so hard to get on the ballot, get libertarians on the ballot again in the future. Of course, that didn't work out. Yeah. Um, and, you know, once again, to like he was, in terms of my views, political views, he was the best candidate on the ballot for me. Yeah, closely aligned. Yeah, I mean, there's some issues where I really take issue yeah. <laughs> with his positions. Or, <laughs> well, and it's not even with his political positions. It's really more with his personal positions. It is. Um, so, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, I think it would be interesting if that was Trump's pick, though. Oh, and I just want to point out, too, um, that... Gary did not get off his fat ass and vote. <laughs> For the record, I was <laughs> I was not on my fat ass when I didn't go vote. Um, I attempted to go, but dude, they were wrapped all the way around. The line yeah. was wrapped all the way around. And we live in Alabama. We mm -hmm. know what's going to happen here. And I know who I was going to vote for. It was yeah. going to be the guy that won. So, yeah. I mean, well, there were only two races of on the ballot that I voted in anyway. Yeah. And the rest I wrote in none of the above. <laughs> well, so, I mean, I always enjoyed, that's actually my favorite part of voting is all of the uncontested ones, which there were a lot of this time. Yeah. Um, I always write people in. And so, I mean, I write in people I know. I write in, you know, Ron Paul always gets a write in. Like, yeah. um, I don't know. It's like, that part's fun to me. And this, I hate that I missed it this time, but the yeah. truth is, is I had, like, I was going to go do it if I could have got in and got out in a reasonable amount of time, mm -hmm. but I had stuff in my personal life that I felt like was far more important than going to cast a vote in an election that was foregone conclusion. Yeah. I just want people to know that on our ballot in Alabama, there were about 15 races and only three of them had more than one candidate. Yeah. <laughs> That's... And neither of our senators were being reelected this time around. So we yeah. didn't have any senators on the ballot, but um, there was a, a Republican, Democrat, Green Party, Libertarian Party on in the presidential race. Yeah. Um, there was our, our federal representative race that had a Republican and a Democrat, and there was a Supreme Court, because we vote for a Supreme Court in Alabama. Yeah. Um, there was a Supreme Court race that had a Republican and a Democrat, and everything else was an uncontested Republican-only race. Yeah. that's. I mean, that's particularly embarrassing for the Democrats. That yeah, they, yeah. Uh, I, I had think I had made the, a comment at our little um, watch party with the Libertarians that if we had had that ballot access, we could have filled all of those yeah. spots with the people and we had like at had our had watch party. Yeah, like, at least with a name. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We could have found enough people in the party to be like, hey, you, will you want to be on the ballot? Yeah. Like, you know. You don't have to do anything. You don't yeah. have to walk around collect well, signatures. Yeah, you don't the have to, party yeah. will do anything that needs to be done. Like mm -hmm. I say, um, yeah, you're just going to be on the ballot. Yeah. So we could have uh, we could have done that, and the Democrats couldn't. It's kind of embarrassing. I'm just saying. I think the Democrats just didn't bother us. It I, save that money for next election. Well, save I, that money for midterms. Yeah, uh, that's that's what they figured. I I assume. Well, they that um, people were going to pour out in droves in Alabama for uh, Donald Trump. Yeah. And I, there's a, there's a bunch of counties where I bet they did have Democrats in all the races, but they yeah. weren't going to bother with that in our County. Yeah. Well, they did win, um, a house seat though. That figures. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. A guy won. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I say, though, <laughs> we will have a Democrat representing us in, in was, it was the house, right? I think I it think was so. the house. Yeah. So. Couldn't be Senate. No, it couldn't be Senate. So it had to be the house. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, there's that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. our governor, lieutenant governor, those things weren't being, um, weren't on the ballot this time either. They yeah. weren't being reelected either. Yeah. So, uh, it was actually a pretty short ballot. Well, I would I had to wait 45 minutes to sit down for five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, -huh. uh, 
Crazy. Well, I would like to say that I did predict it right as far as Trump winning in a landslide. I don't know. I and call this a would, landslide, but uh, it certainly feels like one to me. I mean, mm-hmm. he won um, the popular vote, and the and he's going to end up with a um, a pretty large margin as far as the electoral college um, when it's all said and done. Yeah, it'll be um, th- roughly three ten to. Uh, yeah. 220 or something. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty, that's pretty big. That's a pretty large margin. And we had the results that night. Yeah. It was enough that they had the results that night. That was kind of interesting. And he, yeah. he won like by like 5 million votes in the popular vote. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm saying, I mean, landslide might be a bit of an overstatement, but I don't think it's a lot of one. Yeah. That's actually one of the more interesting things is that I've heard people on the left complaining about the um, popular vote and how, or the total votes. Yeah. Um, and saying, you know, this was supposed to be one of the biggest turnouts in election. We've had hundreds of thousands of new voters since 2020. So why are there 15 million fewer votes than there were in 2020? <laughs> and like, you know, they're, of course, suggesting most of them. Yeah. Some people have been kind of smart about it, actually. But mm. m- most of them are suggesting that there's some kind of foul play in the 2024 election. And I thought... And some of them have seen this too. Yeah. I thought, well, it seems to me that you're making more of a case that there was foul play in the 2020 election. Exactly. (laughs) Where did those 15 million votes come from? Exactly. Um, And where did they go? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, No. That's vote early, vote often. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I think that this does make a really strong argument that there was foul play involved in 24. I mean, in twenty in twenty twenty. Well, yeah. there was foul play in both. Yeah, um, there always is. Yeah, that's that's um, the game. The, it's just it couldn't be overcome this time. The yeah. Trump looked really bad in twenty twenty until you had four years to Joe Biden. Yeah, yeah. And like things got surprisingly worse for a lot of people, and yeah. they said, "Hmm, you know what." Trump doesn't look so. My business was open and be while well, Trump was in office, at least. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I didn't lose everything while Trump was in office. Yeah. Uh, you might this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, I mean, man. we're we're due for another downturn. So I've been saying this week, I'm talking to people that uh, we're due for a downturn. I've been saying we're due for a downturn for a while. Mm-hmm. I don't know that this is the case, but I. I, I think that Trump is going to do enough positive stuff economically to push that back four years. It, it might. I mean, they could almost make it happen immediately by by pushing um, uh, interest rates up to where they probably should be. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about create the crash? Yeah. 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 Um, I Time will tell. We'll see. But I, I And just then they'll blame like, it on Trump. I oh, mean, yeah. You know, yeah, but that that's, would the, be, that's the thing, though. I don't. They think had Trump's, to do it fast. Trump, yeah, yeah. I mean, they would need to do it. I, I don't. So that by twenty twenty eight, people forgot that Trump yeah. was railing on the Fed for pushing the interest rates up. Yeah, because Trump is going to speak out against that. Yeah, like he's not going to just he. I mean, the rates were as low as I forget what they were under him, but they were low, and mm-hmm. he was still trying to push them lower. Yeah, like he uh, was actually advocating at one point negative interest rates. Which yeah. Is, uh, uh, yeah, because they were so kind of disaster. Yeah, which it was. Ar- they were already so artificially low that he wanted to push them to negative. Yeah, like, you want to complain about wealth transfer to the uh, to the already wealthy? Yeah, um, that yeah, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing that does it. We pay you to borrow money, <laughs> right? Okay, yeah. so um, be interesting to see. It's going to be a fun four years, right? Um, and I know we mentioned it at the beginning, but I'll just mention this and then we'll close it out. But um, I, I'm really excited to see if he lets Ross go. That yeah. If he, like, that's, to me, for everybody that was given um, Angela McCardle and the libertarians that were kind of behind Trump a bunch of crap, like, if, if we get that one single solitary thing, it's enough. Yeah. Um, if, we, if we get that or... Yeah. And or, I guess. Or yeah. um a real libertarian in the cabinet. Yeah. I will absolutely write to her and say you are the best libertarian chair ever. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean I, I completely agree. We'll have to wait to see when he takes office what he does. Mm. But I'm saying those those two things are so big. Um it, it's not to be understated. Yeah. So 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, well, ending on positive there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, be aware. Um, I can't sp- speak for my co-host, but I am uh, not Trump delusional. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <I've- laughs> or Trump dedicated or any of those other TDSs. Yeah. Um, I, uh, like, I will absolutely call him out like I did years ago when he's doing stuff that is oh stupid same here um and i tried to make that clear early because i know i was going to talk highly of him through this podcast but yeah. i i have no i know where where how the man operates and i know to be disappointed in him like yeah. like i i want so much and i know you get so little the problem is that we spend so much time also um debunking the lies yeah about him i mean that's what the first one and in fact i have to apologize this was also liberty larry's fault uh always is in the last episode when he brought up the firing squad thing and neither of us i guess i certainly hadn't heard it but i think you hadn't heard the actual quote no at that point i had either. only heard the coverage from the quote yeah which was that that he had said that yeah and, so and, obviously that's not what he said. Yeah. And it's really clear that that's not what he said. Cause you know, if nothing else, most of the time when you're putting somebody in front of a firing squad, you don't hand them a rifle. Yeah, exactly. Um, but so yeah, that was, I mean, we were reporting on the reporting, I guess, and that what little we knew. Right. Um, but that's exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about is like, just stop lying to me. If this guy is so horrible, you don't need to lie about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is the reason they have to lie because he's not as horrible as they want him to be. Yeah. You know, not that he's great, just that he's not that horrible. Yeah. Like, he's not actually a Nazi or a fascist or, yeah. uh, I mean, I think you can make a strong case that. Kamala is more of a fascist than him, but (laughs) apparently people don't know what fascist means anymore. Um, And uh, he's just, I don't know. He's, I I think that he's reasonable. Yeah. I mean, I heard somebody 